Hello again, good morning or good day. Oh, that was a nice project to start my lecture. Now, we're back to the lectures for microbiology series. It's now we'll be talking about Haemophilus and Bordetella. So now let's talk about Haemophilus. So Haemophilus are gram-negative bacilli and your Haemophilus influenza type B is the most important human pathogen and your Haemophilus decreyi is the cause of your chancro. Okay? Your Haemophilus decreyi is a sexually transmitted pathogen okay? that causes chancro. Other Haemophilus are also are among the normal flora of the of the mucous membranes and will occasionally cause diseases let's talk about uh, briefly about hemophilus influenzae hemophilus influenzae are found on the mucous membranes in the upper respiratory tract in humans. It is the most common cause of meningitis in children and also it can cause severe pneumonia and other invasive diseases. These are quite common among children less than 5 years of age and are transmitted to the respiratory tract. So your hemophilus are uh, cocobacilli and the capsule is used for typing of your H influenzae and particular for this organism it, uh, it needs an enhancement growth medium that contains isovitalix okay. and your Influenzae does not grow on sheep blood agar except around colonies of staphylococci and it is known as your satellite phenomenon. And unfortunately, there's been an increase in resistance to ampicillin and chloramphenicol, and these are usually controlled by genes on transmissible plasmids. So your Haemophilus H influenzae contains capsular polysaccharides of one of the six types from A to F. The capsular antigen of type B is a polyribus uh, ribitol phosphate for your PRP. And it will be, uh, this will be positive to a capsule swelling test with a specific uh, antiserum. Just like the test for your pneumococcite is called your Kellan test. Most of the influenzae are organisms, the normal uh, organisms or normal flora of the upper respiratory tract are not encapsulated. The somatic antigens for each influenzae consist of the outer membrane proteins. It has lipo-oligosaccharides, which are your that produces your or are your endotoxins, and they share many structures with those of mycelium. So, hemophilus influenza is a gram-negative. Though some gametid produces exotoxin, but this organism doesn't produce exotoxins. The capsule is an, has an antiphagocytic characteristics in the absence of specific anti-capsular antibodies. The polyribose phosphate capsule of your H. influenzae is the major virulence factor for this organism. The carrier state for the encapsulated Haemophilus influenza or your H influenza type B is around 
2 to 4 percent but the carrier state in comparison to the carrier state of the non-typable one it, it is quite low because the non-typable one has a carrier state of 50 to 80 percent or even higher Your hemophilus influenza type B causes meningitis, pneumonia, and pyema, epiglottitis, cellulitis, septic arthritis, and other forms of invasive infection. While your non typable H influenza tends to cause chronic bronchitis, otitis media, sinusitis, conjunctivitis, it's usually our which usually follows the breakdown of normal host defenses and causes invasive disease in approximately around 5% of cases. Your H influenzae, type B, and your pneumococci, these are the two most common etiologic agents for your bacterial otitis media and sinusitis again. I will reiterate the two most common etiologic agents for bacterial otitis media and sinusitis would be your H influenzae and your non -poxide. Your H influenzae usually will reach the bloodstream and it can be carried to the meninges and may infect the joints, causing septic arthritis. And also can cause fulminating obstructive laryngotracheitis with swollen, cherry red epiglottitis which develops in infants which may lead to tracheostomy or even intubation. Pneumonitis and epiglottitis due to each influenza may follow upper respiratory tract infections in children and even in old immunocompromised or debilitated people. Uh, infection with adults may result to bronchitis or pneumonia. Regarding the immunity of our children to hemophilus influenzae, uh, infants under 3 years of age still has the antibodies transferred from the mother. So, within this period, less than 3 months old, infection with H. influenza is rare. But later on, the antibodies are lost. That's why there will be an increasing incidence of influenza, H. influenza after 3 months of age and your H. influenza is the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in children by 5 months to 5 years. That's the reason because the infants are still protected by the maternal antibodies. So your, the immunization of children with your H. influenza type B conjugate vaccine has decreased the incidence of such infection and it also has decreased the mortality for such infection. Mind you, the mortality rate for untreated H. influenza meningitis is quite high, it is tagged at 90%. Fortunately, most of the uh, H. influenza strains are susceptible to ampicillin. Most, but all strains of your H. influenza are very susceptible to your third generation cephalosporins like your cephalosporin. Cephalosporin usually will yield excellent, uh, cephalosporin IV usually will yield excellent result. That's why a prompt diagnosis and antimicrobial therapy can minimize late uh, neurologic and intellectual impairment because uh, the localization of subdural accumulation of fluids that require uh, surgical drainage are usually our late complications of your H. influenza type B meningitis. So a prompt diagnosis and antimicrobial therapy will minimize such late complications. So 
Perfectly. For epidemiology prevention and control, so the respiratory route is the most common route for the transmission of your H. influenza type B encapsulated. Fortunately, we have the Haemophilus B uh, type B conjugate vaccine has decreased okay, and prevented uh, H. influenza type B uh, infection. And there's with the widespread HIV vaccination, it has greatly reduced the incidence of HIV meningitis in children over 95%. However, for those uh, for cases that your patient will be suffering from HIV influenza infection and there will be exposure of the family members, this infection usually will pose a little risk to adults. But it can uh, produce potential risk for children or siblings uh, who are non immunized. Okay. So, prophylaxis with uh, rifampicin should be given for those children who are at risk, especially those who are in contact of a H. influenza infection. A rifampicin can be given for such population. Now let's talk about the other uh, species of your Haemophilus, your Haemophilus aegypticus. Your Haemophilus uh, aegypticus is currently um, designated as H. influenza biogroup uh, bio aegypticus. It is the, also called your Coxwix bacilli or your H. influenza biotype. It causes your highly communicable form of conjunctivitis and also causes your Brazilian purpuric fever which manifests as fever, shock, and death in children. The next would be your Haemophilus aprophilus. Uh, these organisms are sometimes encountered in cases of infective endocarditis and pneumonia. It is present in the normal uh, oral and respiratory tract flora and is, used, is um, related to actinobacillus. Actinomycetem comitax. That's quite a that's what a tongue twister. Now, we we'll go to another species, it would be your Haemophilus decrea. Haemophilus decrea causes soft chancre or chancroid, which is a sexually transmitted infection. So your chunktoid is a ragged ulcer on the genitalia with marked swelling and tenderness. The regional lymph nodes are enlarged and painful. Differential diagnosis for cyst condition will be your syphilis, your simplest infection, and your lymphogranuloma venous. So your hemophilus decreae are small gram-negative rods that occur in strands in lesion. That's how you diagnose it on your uh, smears. You will see small gram-negative rods that occurs in the strands. So the treatment for such condition would be intramuscular sofriaxone. Yeah, it's quite painful. You can also give oral trimetropin co Sephamatoxazole or your cotrimoxazole or your or erythromycin and giving of such management can result in healing in two weeks. So here are the other um, species of your hemophilus. Your hemophilus hemoglophilus which are which infects the dogs but not humans. Hemophilus hemolyticus, which is the uh, most uh, 
markedly hemolytic organism of the group in vitro. It occurs both in the normal uh, nasopharynx and in association with rare uh, upper respiratory tract infections of moderate severity in childhood. Your Haemophilus parainfluenza resembles H. influenzae. Okay. And is a normal habitat of the human respiratory tract. This one are encountered in infective endocarditis and uh, urethritis. The influenza suis are diseases in hugs. Okay, next, we'll go to your bordatella pertussis, the one that causes your whooping cough or your pertussis. Another species would be your Bordetella parapertusis, Bordetella bronchiseptica, and Bordetella avia. Your Bordetella uh, parapertusis uh, causes similar disease as with your Bordetella pertusis, your Bordetella bronchiseptica, or otherwise called your Bordetella bronchicanis causes uh, kennel cough in dogs and snuffles in rabbits and can cause respiratory diseases and bacteremia in humans. Your Bordetella avium causes tarchycoriza. So it's nice to know that tarchies can help a sipon or colds. That video shows you the classic presentation of your whooping. So you can usually hear that. <coughs> okay. So that's the, your whooping. So your Bordatella pertussis is a gram negative copa bacilli, which has elementos in maglutinin and this elementos in maglutinin aids in the adhesion to ciliated epithelial cells. Your pertussis toxin causes lymphocytosis and synthesization to histamine and enhance insulin secretion and has an ADP ribosylating activity with an A the structure and mechanism of action similar to that of cholera toxin. So your pertussis toxin is similar to your cholera toxin. While your adenine cyclase toxin, your dermonecrotic toxin, and your hemolysins are all regulated by the BVG system, and your tracheal cytotoxin inhibits DNA synthesis insulated cells and is not regulated by PVG. And PLI probably play a role in adherence of the bacteria to the ciliated epithelial cells of the upper respiratory tract. So all of these uh, toxins and glutamines or all will stick your bird of endocortosis to the ciliated epithelium of the respiratory tree causing injury and causing uh, the, the characteristic whooping. Your bordatella has a uh, lipopolysaccharide in cell wall which causes damage to the epithelial cells of the upper respiratory tract. Your Bergatella pertussis survives only for a brief period outside of the human host. So that's one of at least one of, of a something good regarding this organism. They survive uh, only in brief periods outside the human host. And there are no vectors. Blood is not involved. Okay. Transmission is usually via your respiratory route from early cases and via carriers. The bacteria liberate the toxins and substances that irritate the surface cells. 
causing cracking and marked lymphocytosis. Necrosis of the part of the epithelium and their polymorph for nuclear infiltration with polybronchial inflammation and interstitial pneumonia. So that's what happened to the respiratory. Then there will be secondary invaders like your staphylococci or your H. influenzae, they give rise to bacterial pneumonia. And there will be obstruction of smaller bronchos by mucus plugs, which uh, results in atelectasis and diminished oxygenation of the blood. And with this one, it contributes to the frequency of convulsion in infants with whooping cough. So, your Tordatella has two stages. Okay. Initially, it has an incubation period of two weeks, then later on, we will uh, proceed in two stages, your catarrhal stage and your paroxysmal stage, which will be just the characteristic of it. So your catarrhal stage will usually be mild, coffee, and sneezing. It's like an ordinary uh, cough and colds. And in this period, there's a large number of organisms sprayed in droplets. This period, at the catarrhal stage, your patient will be very infectious, but not very ill. But while in your uh, paroxysmal stage, wherein it produces the characteristic poof, in this stage, the cough develops its explosive character and the characteristic poof upon inhalation. So, <laughs> This leads to rapid exhaustion and may be associated with vomiting, cyanosis, and even convulsions. So again, to review your catarrhal stage, your patient may not look ill, they have mild cough and colds, but at this point, they are highly infectious. And later on in the paroxysmal stage, Follows your tactile stage, they will be very ill. They can have whoop on inspiratory sounds, and later on, this uh, successive coughing can lead to rapid exhaustion and can be associated with vomiting, cyanosis, and convulsions. <coughs> So the wolf is a major complications which are usually found in infants. Paroxysmal coughing are usually seen in children and adults. With this, we will see a markedly uh, high lymphocytosis, leukocytosis and an absolute lymphocytosis. So your patient, the WBC of your patient may seem to be like viral but has very high WBC count it's from 16,000 to 30,000 okay. convalescent is usually is low that's why uh, patient will tend uh, to, co to shop the parents tend, will tend to shop doctors okay. and your bordatella pertussis is a common cause of a prolonged, usually from one month to one and a half months, of cough in adults. Okay. So take note of that. It causes prolonged cough from one month to one and a half months in adults. And they will present with the wolf, paroxysm. Wolf are usually seen in infants and paroxysmal coughing are seen in older children when you take their blood exam they have a very high WBC count from 16,000 to 30,000 
with absolute lymphocytosis, not uh, segmental predominance. So how do we how do we uh, identify this organism as first is clinical uh, diagnosis is very important but you can do your laboratory test and these are the uh, there are four ways to, to identify first uh, uh, three ways okay uh, direct fluorescent antibody test you can do culture and even PCR PCR is the most sensitive method for diagnosis. So the preferred specimen is a saline nasal wash. So immunity. So recovery from moving cough or immunization develops immunity. So you give your pertussis um, uh, three primary dose. Okay. Okay. In the first year of life, along with it's, it's contained in your DPT, okay, the primary dose, and later on, uh, you can have your uh, booster dose at one to two years old, the fourth dose. Uh, there can be second infections; they can occur, but usually are mild. And this reinfection usually occurs later in adults. Okay. If they occur in adults, they can be severe. This is the usually adults will complain of headache because of coughing. In women, they usually pee under pee. Okay, they're in their underwears uh, with their underwears when they are coughing. So treatment. Uh, erythromycin given during the cataral stage of the disease uh, usually will promote elimination of the organism and may have prophylactic value. So, giving erythromycin in the cataral stage can uh, decrease or decrease or promote elimination of the organism and can have prophylactic value. While Treatment after the onset of the proximal phase fairly alters the clinical course. Oxygen inhalation and sedation may prevent anoxic damage to the brain, thus preventing uh, convulsions. So, so, your antibiotic treatment is quite effective. Get it on the cataract stage. How to prevent? Uh, infants are given three doses of your pertussis. It is uh, uh, given along with your tetanus and diphtheria. Okay. So three doses during the first year of life, followed by a booster series okay. after a year. Then. Uh, so there are two booster doses as well as a total of five doses then we can give also uh, prophylactic administration of erythromycin for those who are exposed for five days especially that uh, can benefit unimmunized infants or heavily exposed adults so your prophylactic administration of erythromycin so your whooping cough are usually endemic in the most densely populated areas of the world with a high communicability, communicability ranging from 30 to 90 percent most cases occur in children under five years and most deaths occur in the first year of life. Uh, control of whooping cough is achieved um, mainly on adequate 
active immunization of all infants. So that's it. Again, so we've studied uh, your uh, very good lecture for today. And we'll see you again on my next video. Don't forget to click subscribe and thumbs up and open your notifications so that you will know if I have posted another video on my education channel. That's it. Thank you. Have a good day.